Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Thomas Eller, and we're going to be speaking about the invention and introduction of soft multifocals in myopia management. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Thomas Aller. We are uh, honored to have Tom on with us. He has been somebody I've been looking forward to having on the podcast for uh, the entirety of our podcast, uh, but I didn't know him. And uh, he and I are uh, just getting to know each other a little bit. And uh, he is a giant in the field of myopia, the things that he has accomplished, the concepts that he's brought up. And uh, the ideas that he's brought about have really revolutionized so much of what we know about myopia. And it is an honor to have him on the podcast. Tom, thanks for joining me today. Sure, it's my honor, Dave. And I always love to talk about myopia. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, for those few people who there's probably two who don't know you and uh, what you've done in the myopia space, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you currently do? Where you live and so forth. Well, a uh, view behind me is uh, from the Campanile uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, so I grew up in Berkeley. Um, Berkeley's in my backyard, so to speak, actually, I'm in Albany, which is close to Berkeley. Um, I've been involved with myopia research, uh, possibly even during optometry school, but at that time, back in uh, oh, the 80s, uh, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, actually, uh, well, they, we took a walk last on the weekend, um, ended up at the Museum of uh, Zoology. I had a zoology degree and we have a gigantic T-Rex in the um, in the hall there. So I, I got to uh, see him again. But in any case, um, so many years ago, most of us were taught uh, that myopia was strictly genetic and that anybody thinking of doing anything about it was a scoundrel and uh, unethical. So that's basically what I was taught. And um, although I did have an interest in myopia headed into optometry school, uh, I fled zoology because uh, it seemed like it was going to be a life of fighting for grants and just studying things that might interest me but wouldn't necessarily help anybody. Uh, yeah. So I, I moved away from maybe unpractical, unhelpful kinds of endeavors and towards something practical. And for many reasons, I was also seeking out self-employment uh, so that I wouldn't be in a bureaucracy for various reasons. Um, yes, yeah. so that, that's a good fit for me. Um, and, you know, I was an ortho-K patient, actually, uh, from one of the early adopters of May and Grant uh, techniques of daytime ortho K. And that kind of was in the back of my mind when I was trying to figure out what I might like to do uh, yeah. with myself. And ortho K seemed uh, like a great opportunity. Of course, nobody at that time thought it was a myopia control right. technique per se. Um, get to Berkeley, they did a landmark ortho K study, essentially finding that it does a little bit, but Berkeley was never pro ortho K and certainly they were never pro um, any kind of method for controlling it. Uh, so that's what I was taught. And so I wasn't expecting after that education to do anything about myopia, just go into practice. And um, after a few years uh, might have to do with the area that I'm in, you know, it's kind of Northern Silicon Valley uh, where I ended up and everybody just kept getting more and more nearsighted and well past what they like to call the age of cessation, uh, which is a term that should be banned if it hasn't been already. And so I had to confront uh, myself with the question, uh, were my professors and all the textbooks wrong or I'm just a lousy optometrist because everybody's just getting worse and worse and uh, they're genetically pre-programmed to stop at age 16. Well, not my patients. So um, now at that time, there was very little known about effective ways to control myopia other than uh, a bifocal eyeglass study 
on the Eskimos, which mm -hmm. got poo-pooed, but the results were pretty impressive when you go back and look. Um, you know, and then you can be a real critic of studies that don't fit the um, ideal study uh, protocols, uh, randomized control clinical trials, ideal, but there's snippets of information that a rational person can uh, get from many different kinds of studies, including case reports and, and um, you know, case analyses and, per, you know, progression studies and the like. So I was probably dismissive of that study for various reasons. Um, and then there was a bifocal eyeglass study that came out that showed that they didn't work. I said, okay, well, it's just genetic. I guess I can't do anything about it. But then they did a, a you know, a post hoc analysis, which nobody likes. And uh, they found that it worked for ESOs. I said, okay, well, that's something I could hang my hat on and uh, started using bifocals again and found as a clinician, they seem to work. And so, but patients weren't using them properly. You know, they're, they're raising their chin or dropping their chin, these kind or they're taking them off. And uh, around about early 90s, there was a, con you're much too young for this, but there was a contact from Bosch alone called the occasions lens, which is like a, a spin cast lens. I'm, I'm just imagining they spun it faster and it, it made it more aspheric. And they called it the occasions because I think they said, our bifocal is so bad, you'll only occasionally want to use it. And, uh, but I was thinking your bifocal contact is so cheap. Uh, and it, two weeks ago, it was a six month lens or one year lens. I could probably use it as a quarterly lens. It'll be cheap for my patients. We can test it out. And not really to my surprise, but I was quite pleased to see that myopia progression dropped by 80 or 90% in the year after switching to these not very effective contact lenses. So that's wow. what so, so you're doing this in clinic in, in your own practice, yeah. right? And you're doing this on children and you're fitting them with contact lenses, which, yeah. you know, shame on you, but you well, fit these kids with these contact lenses at this time and you're yeah. just tracking it and you're starting to see, well, Hey, this one isn't progressing and this one isn't progressing. And that had to be, quite, uh, quite surprising to you the first time. And then it happened again. And you're probably like, Oh my. And then a third one came in and you're like, Oh, this, maybe there's something here. Do you recall what was going through your mind at the time? Get my patent attorney on the phone. That's, <laughs> that's what was going through. My mind. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so actually what, what, um, you know, I, I tell people that, um, so I respect what can be learned in the clinic because I think I've learned a lot and I'm sure you've learned a lot. You learn a lot from individual patients and a clinician can be convinced with an N equals one study. Right. Now, if you go to an academically minded person and you say, you know, I think I've found something and then, and then I saw two others that are just like it. And I really think this might be something and they would say, oh, Tom, don't you know that the plural of anecdotes is anecdotes, not data? So, yeah. How, yeah. How, much, uh, how much good has been done in the world by one person saying to another, I had this patient, yeah. right? Exactly. <laughs> and what came from it, right? Yeah. Right. And then, you know, we were chatting earlier, maybe we don't want to put this on the... Uh, the official podcast, but in California, they're trying to make it illegal for doctors to have conversations with their patients about concepts that they might have about treating various things that don't align with what's in the textbooks, which is, mm -hmm. is criminal, frankly. And, um, mm -hmm. but that's an aside. So, um, yeah. So, so you, you had these, these patients that were coming in and you started to see this, what, when did you present that data? And then how did this soft multifocal kind of revolution start to take place? Oh, uh, well, it only took 20 or 30 years, but uh, <laughs> so sometimes these things just aren't as fast as you'd like them to be. Um, well, you know, I was talking about a, a clinician can be convinced with an N of one or two or three, but if you want to convince your friends, maybe you need five or six or seven. If you want to convince skeptics, you need studies. 
you know, if you want to convince industry or um, regulatory, you need you need studies, randomized control, clinical trials, and everything. So I thought that I would contact one of my professors at Berkeley, Dave Grisham, who is a yeah. biomolecular vision specialist, and I was thinking back. You know, he seemed to have an open mind, and um, what really I, it got me thinking is this whole ESO thing that um, I was never really able to convince too many of my colleagues about the value of it. But every study that they do when they look at binocular vision effects on anything, but in terms of myopia, for instance, they look at phorias. Now, phoria is what you measure when your hand is covering an eye. And then what happens when you cover the other eye? And I was thinking, you know, that's a just a ridiculous way to study this because, um, Eyes that turn out, but that like to turn out, so exophoria can over-converge when, when the eyes are both open. Eyes that like to cross with a little bit of esophoria, they can be perfectly aligned under binocular vision conditions, so it's irrelevant. Maybe they could still fatigue, so it still could be a hint. But what I started to use, and maybe it was because I was trying to fit it into a busy schedule, but fixation disparity is so fast I just reason that if they have an esofixation disparity when they have their distance glasses or their new prescription on particularly because they come in undercorrected, so they're all exos. Mm -hmm. So if you're in practice at the time and you're thinking, oh, maybe this study from Grovner showed that esos might have myopia, you'd say, well, none of my, my myopes have eso because <laughs> they all come in minus one. And we do know, cover practice. tests before we do the new prescription. So we are, uh, we're doing right. it under the old prescription. Exactly. Their XO. Nobody would do a cover test with a trial lens, you know, any of that. So I would trial lens them. I would do fixation disparity. I'd use fixation disparity to uh, pick the contact lens prescription because at the time, um, well, Earl was probably still working on monkeys, but I don't think he had formulated anything quite yet on concepts about peripheral defocus and other kinds of concepts. Um, although I did have a little something about that in my patent as it turned out, but it wasn't really mostly what I was looking at. The reasoning was bifocal glasses don't work except they do work on ESOs. ESO fixation disparity to me make more sense uh, to um, identify the group that might be bothered by a misalignment of their eyes up close. The thinking was that if you have an ESO fixation disparity and you want your visual system to deal with it, you will relax your accommodation, driving the focus behind the retina in the macula, hyperopic mm -hmm. focus, accommodative lag, uh, and then that would drive myopia. And then if you deal with that, then that eliminates that. So now, Tom, for, for people who used the word fixation disparity last when they were in optometry school, how are you measuring fixation disparity? Can you describe that for those of us who, uh, my wife is a binocular vision doctor, so I hear this word all the time, but for those of us who don't remember fixation disparity, how are you quickly measuring that? Oh, it was very quick. Matter of fact, uh, strictly speaking, I was using the associated foria. So essentially, mm -hmm. You just have them look at a card that's polarized uh, with polarized glasses on top of whatever their trial lens or trial contact, for instance. And then I just use binocular plus until the arrows line up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was it. So that came up with an ad. So it might be a plus one, let's say. And then usually I found that the contacts needed about a, uh, an extra half diopter uh, to in real time do the same thing. So if I measured a plus one associated for you, I give them a plus 150 ad. And um, you mentioned, or you asked about early studies. So uh, Dave Grisham and I started collaborating on a case series. And so um, I would collect the data, uh, prescribe the contacts, send it to him. He'd have some poor uh, suffering student do the work for us. And um, then we'd get a, a case series and we'd prove the concept. And that paper never got published. 
Hmm. It, it was rejected on every continent, frankly. Uh, 90 patients, not all kids. It was half kids and half adults. Because and, and at that time, that probably doomed it as well because everybody said, oh, well, adults don't. Oops. You know, they said... Uh, Adults don't progress. I don't know right. why. Why are you studying that? Matter of fact, uh, let me just get my mic ready. Um, I remember we did a poster, uh, an academy poster, and it was ninety-two cases of of slope changes. So they're going up and up and up, and then you have an intervention. Ninety-two cases. Everybody has this slope change. You know, uh, to me, that's just uh, that looked compelling, right? So someone comes up. I won't mention them, but. He might've been kidding. I, I never could quite tell. He said, you know, Tom, I think what you've done here is at precisely the age of cessation, uh, genetically predetermined uh, by, for all of these patients uh, from ages ranging from 10 to 39, because sometimes 39 year olds act like 16 year olds. So they could have an age of cessation there. Uh -huh. You just happen to put them in a contact lens, and then you have this apparent, you know, slope change. Now, you, you 90 percent of the time you yeah, are acting with the selection me. Why, of the age. Yeah, right? why 90, am I not, patients were, yeah, why am I not making a million dollars in the stock market? Yes, yeah, so lottery yeah. tickets. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's true that if you, you can't draw too many conclusions from, from that case series, but it's, it shows something for Pete's sake, you know, and, and nobody would publish it. They said, you know, oh, it conflicts with the Comet study. You remember the Comet study, bifocals and progressive eyeglasses right. don't work. Therefore, a contact lens bifocal cannot possibly work. And I'm thinking- Because it has to ex act exactly the same. Right. Putting yes, because a contact is an eyeglass. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I, you know, at the time I didn't, I had publications as an undergraduate, but uh, these were my first optometry attempts at publications. And I, I maybe didn't fight it as much, uh, you know, cause I'm just some guy in San Bruno, uh, you know, who's gonna listen to me? They just said, no, uh, you can't publish it. So I said, okay, I'll try somebody else. But you know, they all, they're all at the same parties and they all say, oh, this, you know, so that was a, that was really that was disappointing. But the yeah. but your data, yeah. you, you ended up getting it to stick with somebody at some point, right? You you yeah. throw something against the wall long enough with the right with the right uh, consistency, somebody will listen. Who who started to say, okay, maybe Tom has something here. And, uh, you know, when did, when did it start to catch on that other people were doing it? And, and, and how did that come about? Uh, well, Berkeley, uh, you know, I tease, tease Berkeley at the beginning, you know, textbooks and my professors must have been wrong, but uh, Berkeley classically uh, is, is the home of free speech and free thought. And uh, so there were plenty of uh, those professors there that were, willing to listen. Tony Adams um, was uh, an early supporter and he uh, got me together with Chris Wilsett, uh, one of the world's leading experts in myopia who had just joined the faculty. And she had an interest in um, uh, doing some human work. Most of her work had been in chicken at the time and she does chicken and guinea pig animal models of myopia. And um, we started to collaborate. We put together a proposal, an academy grant actually, and we came in second. And then, uh, but Johnson & Johnson, um, Christina Schneider uh, took an interest and um, she found a way to fund a study. So it was like December 31st, one year, maybe year 2000, she said, I got the money, let's spend it. And um, so <laughs> that's when we started. And, you know, she probably had to twist some arms or um, she went out on the limb. So I, I've all, always appreciated that. Yeah. And um, so that that started the study. And then um, that's that's what gets you credibility. But then it took 10 years to publish that thing. And mm. then they said, oh, yeah, go ahead and present your results. And then I signed up to present it at a. I think it was Singapore 
International Myopia Conference. And then I heard that, oh, wait, wait, you can't, you can't publish it. Um, so they had, they must've had some reservations about it. I thought at the time, well, they've got their own product, their own patents, you know, maybe they want to see what happens with theirs. And uh, turns out many years later, because I would send them new analyses every year. I'd send them supporting papers. I said, look, it's just, let's start treating myopia. You've got a lens. It actually turns out it was a very effective lens design, as you'll see when they mm -hmm. introduce their newest one, uh, which is really going to be great, I think. But um, turns out they never looked at my raw data. Mm. So they just looked at my spreadsheet, you know, which I could just type in. Uh, so they, they just assume that it, I think, you know, that it couldn't be true. I mean, it was outrageous, 90%, 80, 90% control. Half of the patients shrunk their eyes for Pete's sake. That had never been reported before. It was the older half had slight shrinkings, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I think I should have just lied, really. I should have just said, okay, it controlled myopia by 40%. Then it would be, okay, he's full of shit, but we don't have to burn him at the stake, okay? But 80 <laughs> or 90%, this is out, I mean, if you're gonna lie, don't, don't be so outrageous. Nobody's gonna believe you. And if, if, I had, if I had lied and said it was only 40%, it probably could have been published and then I could have done an erratum or something, a letter to the air. Oh, by the way, uh, it's actually 80%, I, you know, transposed a number or something, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so well, there, now there there yeah. came a time where soft multifocals were not this taboo that Tom was creating this crazy stuff, right? So there there came a time, you know, and I think of one of the first studies that seemed in in my mind to put it on the map beyond what we, the work you were doing was when Jeff Walleen started to do some studies around things. Was there yeah. anything that you were like, hey? this helped prove my point before Jeff's work started to come out other than the stuff you were doing. Was there other people that were supporting you in the messaging that you were doing other than, you know, Chris and people that were supporting your research? Well, I mean, I started working with Brian Holden. Uh, yep. Of course. Probably about Oh, six. Okay. Shortly yep. after my, or 05, shortly after my patent issue. Um, yep. He was a, a great uh, believer in collecting uh, intellectual property. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> it was funny. We had a, uh, I was at a meeting and there was the Australia party and I was outside the Australia party and a couple of people came up to me, uh, Jerry Ledgerton for one. And I think Pat Caroline and said, yeah, you got to go got to go talk to Brian Holden, who's a, always just a bigger than Brian's got guy. a foster for you. He's, yeah. he's ready to hand you a foster yeah. beer at the, uh, the, yeah, foster, the Australian well, party. The fosters were for the peasants, you know, he wouldn't drink. <laughs> he said that tastes like piss, Tommy. And, uh, but I said, okay, well, I'm happy to talk with him. You know, so I go up to, I go up to Brian at the meeting at, at the party is loud. You know, I said, I hear you want to meet me. You want to talk to me. So no, why would I want to meet you, mate? And I gave him my name and he said, oh yeah, yeah, I do want to meet you. And we got to talking as loud. And I said, look, you want to talk, let's go outside. So I dragged him out of his own party and we got to talking and had a handshake agreement. And it was the best part of my uh, optometry career, getting to know all those people. I mean, it was, um, that was great. I miss them uh, most days. But um, yeah, so I don't know if that added credibility or not because he, he had his you know detractors, but um, I suppose it mostly added to credibility. I the think patent, when Brian says yeah. something needs to be looked into a little bit further, when yeah. he when he said that, that meant yeah. okay, we need to we need to move on this, and and that was probably really helpful. That's awesome. But it was that development group. So we had Earl Smith and, and his patents and my patents and they were developing patents. And then we joined in patents in the whole process. So it's bringing together the animal research that uh, gave some rationale for why a contact lens would have these additional mechanisms. Yeah. They were always more uh, convinced of the defocus element 
um, more so yeah. than binocular vision element that led me to start using them. But I was happy. To, I mean, I always felt like there are many different mechanisms because um, I've used every type of contact lens. There's another little controversy. Maybe I haven't settled it yet because I haven't done the study, uh, but I've attempted it a few times. Near center lenses work, distant center lenses work, aspheric lenses work, multi-ring lenses work, yeah. echelon lenses work. You ever remember the echelon lens? You're probably too young. Right. But I mean, right. it was a Fresnel thing. Fresnel lenses work. I mean, everything worked. So uh, I was never really convinced that, that it had anything to do with placing the plus in a particular place. So just that perfect place. Well, at the vision by design meeting, Patrick Caroline called you out and said, I think Tom may be onto something just with the fact that we screw something up in the, in the fovea, right. In that fovea region where we create this, this message that is, you know, contradictory to itself. Right. And that, that goes to back up everything that you just said with all of those different things that create something different right in the center, you know, uh, why did those near center studies work, right? Well, because that completely was in opposition to the distant center studies that we think of in this mid peripheral vision, right? So yeah. it kind of goes to back up some of these thoughts that, that with all the research you've done. Yeah, so I, I guess in thinking about mechanisms, because I'd have these arguments with my mates, um, friendly arguments, but uh, I told, look, it doesn't have to be in the periphery. And um, Earl never really insisted that it had to be there. He, he just kind of liked the idea, you know, let's, let's put the medicine that doesn't taste good out where it can do some good, you know? So, and, and Brian's concept, he knew that bifocal contact lenses worked. Um, but his concept was also to give superior vision, which would be nice. You know, if you could align the image shell directly with that patient's retinal shell, maybe you'd have excellent vision. And they have some study, had some studies to show that that might be true in terms of peripheral visual acuity, which we don't measure, or you put it a little bit in front of the retina. It's not on the retina anyway, out in the periphery, no matter what you do, but could we do that on purpose? So that, that was one of the, that was one of the goals of the development project. Yeah. I was always in favor of uh, getting the best efficacy. You know, the other, right. Um, well, uh, yeah. So, so Pat, I mean, Earl, in my mind uh, also, or maybe originally made that point uh, several times is that every form of my optical based myopia control involves a conflict. Yes. And, and it does. So uh, I may have expressed it to Pat one time. I don't know if that's really a unique thought, but um, yeah, I've been convinced for a long time. Uh, and there's probably a lot of biofeedback systems, maybe a lot of industrial processes where if you're getting conflicting data, you don't want like a, these automatic uh, cars now. If, if the car was getting some kind of conflict, like go or stop, I think the car would default to stop or slow, right? It wouldn't be, I can't decide, is that a cliff or is it a virtual background like behind me, right? Let's so, speed up. <laughs> yeah, let's speed up because that will answer the question, right? But you'll die in a fiery crash over a cliff. So it, it just didn't, it felt right that biological systems might default to a, a stop signal. And I don't know that that's yeah. the case, but it just, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Well, certainly a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of things have come out in the last, uh, you know, you look like it's only been 15 years, but it's probably been longer than that, that you've been working at this 30 years or so. Um, what do you, what do you see in the realm of uh, soft multifocals in the future? Like, you're, you're on the pulse, you have this pulse of soft multifocals. What's, what, what, do we, what do we hope to see next? Well, Johnson & Johnson has disclosed their, um, uh, most of their design, I think they're on the market. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in Canada, in Canada, a few other places, maybe, um, maybe Singapore. I don't, I don't recall, but it, they're making it to market with their ability uh, daytime lens. I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. what they call it, but it's a multi-ring, as they've called it, non-presbyopic um, lens with a plus seven ring someplace. You know, if it's a plus seven alternating with others, but, and then there's a big old honking plus 10 smack dab in the center. I mean, uh, I complimented Noel Brennan on, on the design as more details came out. And I said, well, I'm kind of known, maybe uh, Brian tagged me with it one time, uh, or maybe I came up with it, but uh, I like to say it because I think it's true. Any damn plus, any damn place uh, right. kept my concept. And I mean, you look at the, <laughs> you look at the MyoSmart lens, it was just a bunch of dots all over the place. And I got in a little bit of trouble at a conference marveling at how great that did. I said, you know, it's great. You can have near, it was actually a debate with Langis Michaud about near center designs and distance center designs, which is quite amusing uh, when we had the debate because uh, there's no data. So actually uh, I had Earl in the audience as Earl, when I go up there, I'm going to say, I have in my in my right hand, uh, all the data, all the studies showing that near center lenses work. And I purposely had my left hand up. And he was supposed to say, that's your right hand, you idiot. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, it was contrived. But yeah, there are no studies, right? Um, but as part of that, I was saying, I mean, I think that you could put the plus anywhere. I mean, I think you could sneeze on a lens and the droplets would create these little pluses and they would work. So they sort of thought I was uh, dismissing yeah. the science behind their lens, but uh, their inventor was inspired sitting on a bus um, with droplets on, on the window mm -hmm. in, in Hong Kong. And he, he saw that he could see all the signs, everything was clear. And that, that was, his, I, I love inventors, you know, aha movement moments. I've been an inventor Oh, since high school, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a patent attorney almost as long, but not too many victories. It's very hard to get a patent, but um, <laughs> I, I just love the the flash of inspiration. Matter of fact, a flash of inspiration as a component of patent law. You, you need to to have a flash of inspiration. So I, I just love that story with their lens. And um, so um, anyway, I got off on yeah. a tangent. But uh, more exciting things to come, it sounds like. And, uh, you know, we've got other lenses on the horizon that uh, haven't been released or announced and other ones that, that are available in other countries. And uh, just think, it kind of all goes back to uh, some of these early days where you were like, hmm, I wonder. And then look where we are. What, uh, what a legacy, man. What a legacy. Well, I appreciate that. And it's, uh, it's gratifying. Um, yeah, but it, you know, is is a long, is a long stretch, and you have to put up with uh, people doubting you. But I, I think if uh, if you're certain about something, I mean, there's a few other things that really have me interested now. One of which would interest you. You have an interest in dry eyes, I gather, as well as part of your practice, your writings, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, just about every kid every myopic kid seems like has dry eyes. Yeah. And nobody's doing my biography on eight-year-olds. There's, there's hardly any natural history studies, but I started to do that with my lippy view device. And it's shocking. Some of them, they have two or three glands, you know. Now we don't know for sure in one individual, this goes back to N of one, you know, am I going to overemphasize what I see in a single patient or, uh, there's a sibling pair I usually like to present. They both have almost no glands, you know. So when we're, if we're doing dry eye, I think we should look for it in kids. And if we're doing myopia, we should look for dry eye because they're both, I actually wrote an article for review of, uh, I think it was review of myopia management. I coined a phrase for optometry. I stole from Albert Einstein, the grand unified theory of optometry in which I propose that the same behaviors, you know, doing this constantly all day long, uh, lead to both myopia and to dry eyes. And at the time I was thinking, 
uh, maybe retinal damage. Um, that's going to be harder to prove, but yeah. I, yeah. I checked macular pigment density on my daughter at the time I was thinking of the study and she had completely depleted pigments. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I mean, what if, what if we're depleting that? And so I'm less convinced of that, but dry eye and myopia for sure, the behaviors, the exact same behaviors lead to both. So if we're treating one, we're to look for the other uh, or treat both. So we can't yeah. just treat dry eye. I mean, my, uh, myopia with contacts that negatively impact dry eye without also taking responsibility for uh, lessening damage over time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Tom, for being on the podcast. It's absolutely fantastic to hear this history and learn a little bit more about you and the process that has got us here. I appreciate you being on the, on the show. Well, I appreciate the opportunity and Kind of sneak in that plug for that movie? Yes, Kevin? please do. Yep. All right. So there's a movie that's supposed to be coming to screens near everybody, maybe next year. It's called Losing Sight Inside the Myopia Epidemic. And it's by a filmmaker, Jane Weiner. Uh, perhaps she can do a podcast with you. Uh, she was a longtime social friend of Josh Wallman, a giant in the field of myopia, animal research models. And through him, met all of these researchers, um, many of whom uh, your listeners, optometrists interested in myopia would know. And um, it's getting close to making it to market. So they're going to have a worldwide screening on November 3rd, I think. Um, yeah, November 3rd. And um, she hopes that optometrists can invite their patients to view it. And so um, I can get you details on that later if you want to uh, put a little banner on, on this later. But um, invite your patients to view that screening. It'll maybe be six minutes. Um, this film, if completed, would really be the best promotional film for the value of optometry to society, I think, that could ever be done without it being you know, a, a promotional film. It just happens to have optometrist vision researchers, op ophthalmologists, uh, and it just shows what many have done and what their, um, you know, the contributions will be for protecting the sight of millions in the future. So it's, um, it, it, it should be a great film. I'd yeah. like optometry to help it come to uh, fruition. Absolutely. So Tom, you, you were involved in, in this film. This film is coming out, uh, remind me of the name of the film again. Losing Sight. Losing Sight. And I've seen portions of it. And we will uh, post some information about it uh, along with the podcast. We're going to have Jane on the podcast. We're working on scheduling that. Uh, likely this particular podcast will be scheduled after it goes out. And so we'll have more information about that is, uh, as time goes on. But thank you for being a part of it. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned next time as we talk to incredible innovators like Dr. Thomas Allen. Thank you so much for being on the show. All right. Thanks for the invite. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.